Hi, and welcome to the Church Renewal Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Edwards. The Church Renewal Podcast is a ministry of Flourish Coaching. Flourish exists to set ministry leaders free with the gospel to be effective wherever God's called them. This is the first episode in season two of the podcast. Back in season one, we defined church renewal and looked at the aspects and characteristics of a renewed church. You can find all of the episodes of season one in your podcast feed on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Here in season two, we're going to begin looking at the building blocks of church renewal or Renewal 101, what are some of the key concepts and ideas that pastors and ministry leaders need to have in mind as they begin the process of renewing their church? Our executive director, Matt Bowen, will join us today to talk about the life cycle of the church and and understanding where you and your congregation are in the natural ebb and flow of church life before you begin the process of renewal. We're excited to be on this journey with you. If you want to reach out to Flourish, you can always find us at flourishcoaching.org. All right, let's dig in and see the ways that Jesus is renewing his church. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Matt, how you doing, brother? Doing all right. It's good it's to have spring you. in Seattle. We had some yesterday. Oh, great. And then you'll have one more day of sun and then it'll be uh, cold and dreary and rainy again, right? Oh, you mean the way it woke up this morning? <laughs> you know, I, I'm in Western Pennsylvania and supposedly we get more precipitation a year than you guys do in Seattle. Actually, it's kind of bizarre. So I used to live right near where Alan lives. And uh, when we moved out here, people were like, oh, you're going to hate it. It rained so much or whatever. We were like, oh, we lived in Pittsburgh. It was perfect preparation. <laughs> 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 well, Matt, we are uh, starting season two of the podcast here. I think this is going to be episode like 32. Really? That's craziness. Yeah. Uh, 32 Very episodes. That's, it's basically our podcast is millennial. It's 32 episodes old. I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, it's not a millennial because we don't really have an Instagram feed much at all. Anyway, okay. So uh, here on season two, we're going to talk more about the the building blocks of church renewal. Last season, we really focused on the definition, what is a renewed church? And for folks listening today, you can hear the wrap of season one, where Matt and Paul Hahn, uh, the director of Mission of North America for the PCA, talk about the definition of church renewal. Uh, and today we're going to get more into the process itself, the, the building blocks. Um, and so over the next several episodes, we're going to look at different topics. And today, Matt, we're going to start with understanding the life cycle of the church. Um, what do we mean when we say the life cycle of a church? So church life cycle is something that's been well recognized. Probably, oh, the first author, um, Arnold Cook in Historical Drift, was probably the first one to identify um in sort of a modern book, uh, the idea of church life cycle. And, and here's the concept. Um, my mentor in seminary used to say that all churches are subject to the second law of spiritual thermodynamics, which is that just as the, the universe is running down, so does spiritual life. Spiritual life ebbs over time. And the way that happens in a church is that you lose focus. So the original vitality that you had uh, in the church, the things that Paul and I talked about in the first season, you those things that you embed in the beginning when you plant a church, um, they just get lost over time. Churches lose their way. They get mired down in conflict. All the kinds of myriads of things that you see in the New Testament that plague churches still plague churches now. And so what happens is that the original vitality that you had get lost, gets lost over time, and the church moves through a, a, a cycle that's variously described, but I have found um, under the influence of a guy named Ken Pretty, who hopefully maybe we can get for an interview on the podcast here at some point, um, just because it's an easy way to remember it. Churches move through um, a sequence of three. Um, stages, uh, incline, recline, and decline. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go. But incline is really um, a stage where churches are growing in ministry capacity. Um, notice how carefully that is said. Before you get into defining each of those stages, can we? Can I insert a question? 
Sure. Um, just to, just to, just so you don't get on the train and then, cause you could go through defining all three before we get moving. Um, so Ryan, just, uh, if you can cut this uh, where Matt kind of named the three and then uh, try to pick up uh, here, if that's possible. So Matt, uh, incline, recline, decline, what value is it for a local church leader or a leadership team to understand where they are? Why does the label even, before we get into the, like, the labels and, and what those stages look like, why does understanding where you are matter? <laughs> So if you don't know where you are, you don't know what kind of help you need to address where you are. And so if you um, misidentify where you are, you will misapply the kind of uh, help that your church could need. Um, so let me give you, a, for example, uh, from another another setting. Um, your car is having difficulty braking. Uh, and so you go, oh, when I was growing up, um, when our car had difficulty braking, my dad changed the brake pads. And so you take the time to get brake pads and you put the car up on jacks and you change the brake pads uh, only to find out that once the brake pads are changed, that you take the car out for a test drive and you still have trouble braking because the issue wasn't with the brake pads. The issue was you had dirty fluid. Or the issue was you had a malfunctioning master cylinder. Or the issue was the connection between the pedal and the master cylinder was bad. So if you diagnose incorrectly what's wrong, you're going to apply the wrong solution. And there are different so really kinds the of solutions. Here, Matt, so the takeaway here is that I shouldn't try to fix my car. <laughs> <laughs> I have no business. I have no business trying to fix my car. That's I understand what you're saying. No, that's good. Okay. So Matt, if you don't know where you are, you don't know uh, what you need to do to either stay healthy or become healthy as a church. So given that, let's go through these uh, different life cycle stages of the church, incline, recline, decline. What are the characteristics that distinguish these three stages? So um, at least the way that I learned it uh, from Ken, and I think that it's, this remains helpful and has stood over time. Uh, we have a whole seminar where we talk about this and I give more detail, but let me just give you sort of like, um, I don't know, seven or eight or nine um, dimensions uh, that are different um, across these different um, stages, right? So incline, recline, decline. Um, there is a difference in terms of time orientation. And maybe you want to stop me after each of these and make sure that I've been clear, Alan. But um, so there's a there's a difference in terms of time orientation. Um, on incline, a church is future oriented. They're looking ahead um, to what God might do through them. Uh, in recline, the time orientation is present oriented. Uh, they're just thinking about now um, and how to keep what they have, and not to move towards something else in the for going forward, but to keep what they have. In a decline, the, the time orientation is past oriented. Their best days are past, and they look back at them fondly. Um, but they're sort of, uh, if you will, stuck in the past, maybe even making a monument um, to the past. So the first difference between the incline, recline, and decline is their time orientation. Are they looking to the future, are they looking to the present, or are they looking backwards uh, at the past? The second um, uh, characteristic uh, that distinguishes these three is what the church is driven by. So if you come and observe uh, the church's ministry, um, what is it? What is the main driver behind what they're doing? Um, in, e in incline, because they're future oriented, they're vision driven. They're being drawn forward by a concept of how God would use them um, to see disciples made, to see the Great Commission happen um, in their community. Uh, which we'll get to next in terms of where the focus is. Uh, but they're vision driven. They're drawn forward by a, a clear view of what they're asking God to do uh, through them in terms of seeing the great commission of seeing disciples made in their community. In recline, a church has fallen into being program driven. Uh, programs are meant to be uh, in a church's ministry. Uh, the response to the fact that vision is um, ministering to people and there are people to be ministered to. Uh, 
Um, and so you don't hire a youth pastor, for example, to get a bunch of youth to your church. You hire a youth pastor and you develop a youth ministry because the Lord's giving you a bunch of youth and you want to minister to them. Um, but in a church that's in recline, uh, the youth ministry has become not a part of the vision of accomplishing uh, the making of disciples, but it's become a program for us to maintain and keep. And our hope really is within that program uh, or a whole series of programs. And so in recline, it's not vision driven, but program driven. So the problem isn't the existence of program. It's when keeping the program going becomes the mission of the church rather than the mission and vision of the church driving which programs you select. Correct. And that tells you, can you kill this program because it's no longer helping you accomplish the vision? Um, right. And by the time you get to decline, that becomes nearly impossible because in decline, you're structure driven. The, the, so uh, to change the analogy slightly, um, trellis and vine, right? If you're familiar with that book, if you're not, you should be. Um, but in uh, to change the language over a little bit to trellis and vine, right? Um, is that in um, in terms of being a structure-driven church in decline, the trellis is vastly larger than the vine. In fact, it overshadows the vine and it keeps the vine from growing because it provides too much shade to it. It's this little tiny vine and the trellis has overgrown the vine. And so, but the, and now suddenly the maintenance of the trellis, so we don't feel shame over the fact that we've got to, you know, shrink the trellis down to fit uh, the actual vital ministry that's going on. Uh, we can't, we can't, um, within our self concept, we can't uh, eliminate some of the structure because it's our sense that we're still uh, important in doing something. Um, where when trellis and vine are working well together, when you're vision driven, um, the trellis is just slightly larger than the vine and enables the vine to grow and they don't overshadow each other. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, so moving then into decline, what is really the driver in decline? So that trellis, um, the structure of the ministry of the church, it's the thing that drives things. And so funding the existing structure, maintaining committee structures just the way that they were, maintaining sometimes staff levels um, mm -hmm. beyond what they ought to be. Uh, for what's going on. And so the structure ends up being the driver. It's the decision-making things. Oh, we need to do everything that we can in order to keep this going, right? Even right. though it's not actually making disciples anymore. Right. And so uh, it's the church with 60 members and 20 committees. Yeah, that's exactly right. I knew a guy um, in uh, in the, within the Beltway area of Atlanta that was in a little um, patch community <clears throat> is what you call it in Western Pennsylvania, but it was a little mill town. It was next to a creek. It was kind of down in a hollow. And it was a church of like maybe a hundred people with 24 committees. Mm -hmm. And everybody was serving in multiple committees. And it was their way to feel like they were still valuable and vital, but it was just strangling it. Absolutely right. strangling it. Um, right. And that was a typical structure driven. Right. So, are there any other real key distinguishing characteristics of a church that would help you understand we're in incline, recline, or decline? So there's the time orientation, future, present, past. There's the what drives the church, vision, program, or structure, right? And then where's the focus, right? So the church is on incline. Churches get planted. They're growing in ministry capacity when they're looking at their community and going, how is it that God would have us minister here? to these people at this time, right? And so it's the people that are in the, the, uh, the, the unchurched community that does, doesn't know Christ that the church is focused on. They're looking at the demographics of the church, of the community. They're looking at the needs of the community. They're looking at what other churches are doing and not trying to replicate what other churches are doing, but uniquely what God's called them to do. So they're community focused. They're focused on the community that the, the local geographic community that's unreached, that doesn't know Christ. Um, in incline, that's what you do. Um, in recline, you're congregation focused. Uh, we have these people, we need to keep them happy. And so um, we're focused on the congregation, uh, keeping those that we have. Uh, and then in decline, you get core focused. It's really just about keeping these three or four families happy. 
right? And making sure that they stick with us and that they, they're still happy with us because they give the money and they're the ones that are in the power. Um, and so who gets the focus tells you um, which stage the church is in, whether it's an incline, recline, or decline. In incline, it's the focus is on the community. In recline, the focus is on the congregation. And in decline, the focus is on the core people uh, and keeping them happy uh, and present. Sure. There's also, to move on to the next one, um, the, the way that we think about doing ministry. Um, and so in incline, um, it is very innovative. New ideas are welcomed because we're, folk, we're pulled forward by vision. We're focused on this community. We're thinking, what's the best way that we could minister to this community of people that don't know Jesus, so they'd come to know Jesus and get discipled in him, right? And so in incline, uh, the, the manner, of, the, of course, in terms of doing ministry is that it's very innovative. In recline, it's very routine. Uh, this is just what we do, you know, and this is, we're, we're comfortable with it. It's good. We know how to do this. Um, we got people, we know, we know how to go about this. And so it's just routine. We're doing it. Uh, it's working. It's fine. In decline, the, you then move into being complacent. Uh, I wouldn't do us any good to try anything else anyways. You know, and so, uh, you know, oh, we've it, always it done it work, this way. It didn't work when we, yeah, we didn't work. That, that won't work here. That can't possibly work here. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep. And so you go from innovative to routine to complacent. Okay. Um, and, and related to that, I think, is this next area, which is how do we, uh, what does it look like for us to trust the Lord as we go out in ministry? Right. So in incline, it's high risk. It's high risk faith. Right. We're going to we're going to budget. We're going to try new things. We're going to be innovative. And so it's it's high risk. Right. Um, we're going to trust the Lord and we're willing to fail because that's what you do for the sake of the kingdom. I was reminded recently in some doctoral classes that the early uh, late 19th century, early 20th century missionaries that went out, say, with like the Christian Missionary Alliance, um, they would pack their belongings in their own wood coffin. Because the life expectancy on the fields in the third, what we would call the third world now, um, was about two years. High risk faith, right? Or, People that become a part of a church plant, high risk faith, right? We're willing to try new things. We're willing to stick our necks out there because we want to see people come to Christ. And we realize that that's going to be, there's going to be some risk involved in that. We're okay with that. In right. recline, you've become, you've beca started to become protective. Well, you know, we don't really want to rock the ship. We've got a good group here. We don't want to, you know, we got to keep doing what, what brought them here. we got to keep doing to keep them here. So it's low risk faith in recline. And then in decline, we're not taking any risks anymore. we got to keep this core group of people here. Remember, we're core focused, right? Right. right. And so we got to keep this group of people here. And so we're not taking any risks at all because we can't afford to lose any of them. So um, Matt and... I know you've kind of said that there are nine or 10 of these different kind of characteristics and we've kind of worked through probably half of those. And I think people who are listening would probably start to get a sense of those differences. Uh, if they wanted to really dig in to each of these characteristics, uh, you mentioned that, that some of this model comes from Ken Pretty. Are there other, other, I, I want to ask, um, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about just like sense and feel of these different stages. So, so a little, maybe, a little higher level than like the detail we're going into now. Okay. Um, but if someone wanted to dig into the detail, what's a way that they could really dig into these? Is this material from Ken published? Is it? Uh, yeah. So I have one PDF that goes through this in some detail that we can make available to people um, that Ken wrote some years ago for uh, one of the denominations that he had worked with. And so, yeah, we can make a PDF available to people that in the show notes and, you know, we can share it off of our drive. And so, yeah, so people could really dig into this if they'd like to. Yeah. So if I'm listening in my car or, or while I'm on a walk and I, I don't have time to like line out each of these characteristic differences, what would you say is like the feel of the room on Sundays or in church events? What's the difference in the feel of the room on incline, recline, and decline? Yeah. So I would say that on an incline, um, there's, there's anticipation. Um, there's a sense the Lord's really using us. Um, 
we're seeing people, you know, regularly come to Christ and be baptized and people are growing in their faith and we're trying new things. Um, and so there's, there's kind of a, um, almost an excitement, uh, that, that Jesus promised that the, the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against the church and we're seeing it happen here. Right. Um, right. so that would right. be incline. Okay. I think in recline, um, it's, you know, what's odd about recline is that it's what everybody has been shooting for. Um, oh. Incline, the motto of incline, if, if people want to, you know, um, look at our, our training workshop on this, the, the motto of incline um, is this is hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are really having to lean into it and risk their time and their faith and their energy. And it's also very satisfying, right? The motto in recline is, whew, we made it. Yeah. And so oh, there's so, really oh, a... So right when you think you've... Like, that's how I feel when I get into a recliner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love I'm my done. recliner. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is great. I get to kick up and <clears throat> life's good at church and recline. You know, they've kind of made it through... You know, are we going to have enough money? Do we have enough staff here? Do we have a stable building facility? You know, they've sort of, they, they, they made it. And everybody actually right. wants that because comforts are hidden idol in the West, in the church, right? Um, right. And in, I think in decline, it's, it's remorse, it's regret. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, low self, it's low church self-esteem, right? Mm, sure. We used to be better than we were. Yeah, this this um, place used to be so full and right. There, there used to be so a, many kids running around, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a group sense of depression. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. So here's what's ironic: everybody shoots for recline, but the the way that I tend to put it with people is that as soon as you've turned the corner from incline to recline, you've begun to sow the seeds of your own destruction. Mm. Um. Faith is meant to be sacrificial. Jesus doesn't say, uh, you know, it's kick back in your recliner and follow me. He says, you know, pick up, pick up the cross and right. follow me. The right. Christian life is meant to be sacrificial and risk-taking faith and to take prayer and dependence and um, to feel tired because you spent yourself for the sake of Christ because you're thankful for his grace yeah. and you want to see other people come to experience it. So for our listeners who are hearing these descriptions of incline, recline, decline, and they're thinking about their own congregation, maybe they're a pastor or they, they're sitting in the pews and they're thinking about their own congregation and they hear these descriptions and they say, oh, we're on incline. That's really exciting. Oh, we've entered recline. That's, I hadn't really realized that. Or yeah, I, yeah, I knew I was in decline before you said anything. Um, so for our listeners who are kind of doing some self-diagnosis, um, as a kind of closing thought here, what is it that keeps a church on incline on incline? What is it that gets a church on recline or decline back to, to the incline phase of the church life cycle? Yeah. In a word, <clears throat> I would say scorecard. Um, okay. So what, what, when we look back on a year of ministry, what do we look at to evaluate a year of ministry? The church that's on incline is consciously keeping a spiritual vitality scorecard in mind. They're looking at things like, did we see people come to Christ? Have we seen people trained in evangelism? Have we thoughtfully, do we continue to thoughtfully engage our community? Are we pulled forward by vision, right? Those are the kinds of things that they're scoring if they're a mm -hmm. church. The church that's in recline goes, <clears throat> did we make budget? Um, were we able to retain our staff? Um, can, are we able to maintain our programs? Right. So that's what they're scoring. The church right. is in decline is scoring, man, did we keep our core? Because, boy, we need those people to give. Right. right. Have, have we done nothing to rankle anybody? So um, my, my experience with the phrase scorecard comes from working in the industry in healthcare. If I'm, if I hear that phrase scorecard, I'm a little, you know, uh, well, is that extra biblical? Ha. I mean, Jesus has a, an implicit quote unquote scorecard for the church, right? We see it in Jesus's letters to the churches. Absolutely. In Revelation one and two and three. Uh, we see it in uh, a Paul telling churches whether or not they're healthy and all the epistles, right? We're not talking about something we might be using an extra biblical word in scorecard, but we're not talking about an extra biblical concept. No, not at all. 
We're trying to say, is a church, can a church actually say, we are genuinely oriented around the fulfillment of the Great Commission? Does that show up? And is that what we are most concerned about? Because if it is, everything's driven around that. Right. And if we're not, if we've lost that sense, if we've lost that first love for Christ that would show up in us actually living in light of, um, you know, today dawn, because Jesus is yet gathering a people and using us to do it. Can we say that our church is genuinely oriented around that reality? And that's what grounds everything that we do. If I'm listening and I feel like frustrated or depressed or even ashamed of where my church is in the life cycle, I mean, do you see churches turn around? Does it happen? Absolutely. It absolutely happens. But it happens because the leadership goes, oh my, we have been looking at the wrong things. We have been leading in the wrong ways. Jesus, forgive us. We repent. And we're going to begin to try and lead uh, in the right direction. And Jesus honors that, right? That's his heart is with the churches that are struggling. That's why you have the entire, almost the entire New Testament is that you have on display Jesus' heart for churches that are struggling, that have lost their way, that need to get directed back onto the path. And so God's heart is with struggling churches, and he pleads with them to, to turn and to come back to him and to come back to his priorities. Hmm. Well, if our listeners are feeling that sense, they desire to get their church back on Jesus's priorities. We've mentioned some great resources already uh, from Arnold Cook, from Ken Pretty, the Chalice and Vine, the PDF that we'll make available on Church Lifecycle. Um, any other practical advice you'd have for someone who says, okay, by faith, Christ, we want to we want to get back on the mission of Jesus as a church. We want to get to a healthy place in the church life cycle. Uh, practical things that they could do today. Yeah, I think that one of the things that you could do, um, particularly if you're a church leader, is to say is to is to develop what would it look like for a church to be healthy, and what's the first thing? What would be the most important thing for our church to begin to look at, to where we could take one step today to being more healthy? Um, a lot of times for a church, what we find is if they will go back and restudy their community, we're actually doing this with a client right now. We've just entered this with a client. And it's so much fun to actually go and relearn your community because then God begins to pull out of you and you go, oh, wow, uh, my zip code here in Seattle that I live in, we have um, a disproportionately large number um, of single, uh, single mother households um, in of Hispanic families where the fathers just are not present. Mm -hmm. You know, just discovering that about our community really pulled the heart of God's people out. We were like, how could we minister to them? That's awesome. And so sometimes just resetting the community and asking God to give you a heart for these people can change the driver of everything else. Um, mm. But the first thing is, that you've got to regain a heart for people that don't know the Lord. And so maybe that's a great place for your church to start. That sounds like a great place to start. And this is a great start to season two of the podcast. We're going to be working, walking through some of these foundational concepts of how to do church renewal. Season one, what is the definition of church renewal? Season two, we're, we're working through these foundational concepts. And today we put in building block number one, understanding where your church is in the church life cycle. If you'd like uh, to talk more about this, uh, well, first, thank you, Matt, for, for kind of walking through this, this idea with us. If, if you, a listener, would like to learn more about understanding where your church is in the life cycle, you can access the resources that are in the show notes uh, attached to the podcast. You can always reach out to us at flourishcoaching.org slash contact. I'm Alan, A-L-L-A-N at flourishcoaching.org. And you can find us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash flourishcoaching and the number one. Thanks for listening to the Church Renewal Podcast. I've been your host, Alan Edwards. And Flourish is here to set ministry leaders free to be effective wherever God has called them. When pastors and churches feel stuck, Flourish coaches come alongside them, renew their hope in the gospel, and help them gain clarity about their situation. There's a reason we do this podcast. Jesus is still gathering his people. That's the only reason today dawn. The only fully sufficient reason that today dawn is that Jesus is still gathering his people. And the ordinary way he does that is through the church. So let's pray together for the renewal of Christ's church.